Folks, Jesus is everything. He is everything. No matter what we're going through, no matter the hurt and the pain that we have, no matter who turns against us, or uh, whether it's a health issue, whether it's a financial issue, uh, whether it's a family issue, folks, the answer is Jesus. And we have to just keep believing and keep trusting in Him. We're going to continue our series through the book of Acts. And uh, we are preaching verse by verse and line by line through the book of Acts. And today I want to share with you journey to Jerusalem. Journey to Jerusalem. Uh, Paul was headed to Jerusalem. He is about to finish his third missionary journey. And uh, he has got his sight on Jerusalem and then Rome as we saw last week. Let me give you the outline I have this morning. Number one, Paul's farewell messages. Paul's farewell messages. He went back to the uh, towns and the churches that he founded, and uh, he wanted to uh, have fellowship th with them one more time. And uh, you know, folks, next week I'll be talking about how hard it is to say goodbye, and you can see that in Paul's, uh, you know, writings and in the scripture that will follow our focus scripture today. But Paul's farewell messages. Number two, Paul's farewell services. All right, he had a service that I'm telling you, nobody will ever forget. If you were there, I'm just telling you, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a minute, God performed a miracle, and it was just an amazing service. And number three, Paul's farewell journeys. Uh, folks, uh, being a missionary, you always have to uh, learn to um, improvise, you have to adapt, and you have to overcome. Twice in our text, Paul's life will be threatened. Everywhere he went, his life was threatened. And folks, we don't face persecution. There are missionaries in third world countries uh, that face it every day. There are countries that if you carry a Bible, you will be arrested. But I thank God that that is not true in the United States of America. And so we need to pray for our persecuted Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we've entered the final third of the book of Acts, and Dr. Luke records Paul's journey to Jerusalem, his arrest there, and his voyage to Rome. Paul was truly determined to finish his ministry with joy in his heart and the gospel of Jesus Christ on his tongue. I do not think anyone who has read about Paul's ministry of church planting, preaching, and discipling new Christians would doubt his love for God and the desire to please God in all areas of his life. Paul's love for Jesus Christ also showed what a great leader he was in ministry everywhere he went. Paul's love for God's churches really showed in the suffering he was willing to go through for the cause of Christ. You could really see all the fruits of the Spirit in Paul's words and actions. Let's look at his final journey towards home, uh, then Jerusalem, and then on to Rome. Uh, this will complete Paul's third missionary journey. And I believe with all my heart, uh, I was looking this over again early this morning, and we have a mission statement that we have and that we have made, but I believe Paul's mission statement would be something like this. His mission statement could have been, love God, love people, love God's Word, and love his church. And I believe the Bible teaches all four of these things. Journey to Jerusalem, Acts 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, last week we talked about the riot. Uh, we talked about Paul wanting to go out in the theater where there were somewhat, maybe 25,000 people there. And for two hours they chanted uh, to their God, to the God in, in the temple in uh, the Diana and, and these false gods, and finally uh, the, the governor, uh, excuse me, the mayor, got everyone to settle down and leave the place. Paul called the disciples to himself, and he embraced them. Folks, I am telling you, there's nothing better than Christian fellowship. There's nothing better than uh, breaking the bread. Just today, we are breaking the bread, the Word of God, with one another. We are asking God to teach us something today. We are asking God to speak to us today. And Paul had spent three years 
three years in Ephesus. He had given his life, and he had given his blood, and he had given his heart, and his sweat, and his work, and his prayers to these people because he knew uh, the, the spiritual battle that is going on. And listen to me, folks. Satan is upset. He hates what's going on in the world. He hates the Christian world. And he's going to try to trip you up. He's going to try to des uh, destroy you. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And he departed to go to Macedonia. And again, he left Titus at Corinth there. Now, when he had gone over that region, encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And again, uh, in three months there, he wrote the book of Romans. I can't imagine writing the book of Romans in just three months. I'm thinking it would have took me two years, all right? But Paul was so in tune with God. Paul was so in tune with the Word of God. Paul's fellowship with God and prayers and seeking God's will. Folks, he sought God's will before he did anything. And there were times that even the disciples questioned his journeys and questioned what he said and, and questioned. But folks, I'm telling you, he was in tune with God and he knew what he was doing. And it says, and when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return uh, through Macedonia. How would he know? How would he know his life is in danger? Because if you think about it, if you're on a ship, all right, and there are a lot of people on that ship, at night time, somebody could just chunk you overboard, all right? And they wouldn't even know. They wouldn't know what happened to you. And these Jewish leaders hated him so much these people hate him so much that he would do that. So the Holy Spirit warned him. And folks, I'm telling you, if we're in tune with God, we know when to do something and when not to do something. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. And instead of sailing, he walked. And folks, I can't imagine how many miles he treaded uh, uh, you know, on his mission trips. I'm, I imagine his feet were blistered. I imagine his feet had calluses on them from the miles that he walked. And then it says in verse 4, in Sopater of Berea, and again, there are seven men that he says here, and he lists them with the town in which they came. And these men are leaders of that church that he planted. These men were there to assist Paul, to learn from Paul, Paul was their mentor. And of the seven names, five of them I have, have trouble pronouncing. So we're going to go on to verse 5 right now. I tried Saturday for 20 minutes to figure it out, and I wasn't going to let you laugh at me today. These men, all right, going ahead, waited for us at Troas, and we sailed from Philippi, after the days of unleavened bread, in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Notice the word we there. He is speaking of Dr. Luke. So there's, you know, he had stopped in Philippi, and, and Paul, when he left, he stayed there. And one of the things Paul always did, he left leaderships in those new churches. Men that were grounded in the word. Men that could disciple other people. And what he was doing was he was gathering these folks up and he was going to uh, give a last hurrah. He was going to give a farewell speech. And he was going to talk to them about the importance of keeping that church going and keeping God in the center of that church. And that it was all about Jesus. And so uh, we here means Dr. Luke uh, joined him again and he was with him the rest of his journeys. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but minister uh, through whom you believed as the Lord gave each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives 
the increase. Folks, I am telling you, it takes us all. No member of this church is more important than another member. We are all in equal basis. And it doesn't matter, you know, when somebody thinks the whole deal is on the pastor, and it is not, folks. You bring people to church, and if they get saved and walk down the aisle, you had something to do with that salvation. So then neither he who plants is anything or he who waters, but God gives the increase. Twice he says it. Folks, always give God credit where credit is due. God is working. God's Spirit is convicting. No one gets saved unless God draws you unto salvation. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Folks, we're all one in Christ. And Paul is telling these guys, unity in the body of Christ is so important. The Spirit cannot work where there's division and where there is hate. When there is signs and when there is attitudes, when people are looking around and comparing uh, things to one another or what somebody has on or what somebody has done, folks, we can't do that. It is God. It is God's work. And we will be rewarded at the judgment, at the bema seat of Christ. There are rewards. Verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. We are the church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. We come on Sundays and we come on Wednesdays to get recharged, to go back out into the world and to show people the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, according to the grace of God which was given to me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds upon it. Oh, folks, I thank God for the pastors that pastored before I came. I thank God for the Leroy Fritches, those people that were down and uh, when the church was hurting and when the church was small and all these things were happening, they stayed there for the fight. I thank God for, for interims and people that stayed in the pulpits and kept preaching the Word of God. I thank God for these uh, pastors that are 70 and 75 and 80 years old that are preaching the Word of God. Folks, those are the ones that we need to learn from. Those are the ones that have the scars. Those are the ones that have the hurt, the hard times. And folks, I'm telling you, it is all God. This is not my church. I've heard people refer to it as your church. It's not my church. It's God's church, folks. It's God's. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Folks, my job is to keep Jesus Christ in the center of everything we do. If we will do this, He will bring the harvest. Psalm 133. Go with me to Psalm 133. I love this Scripture. God just popped it in my head this week. Psalm 133. It's talking about unity and the people of God. Behold how good, how pleasant it is uh, for brethren to dwell together in unity. Yeah. Folks, unity in spirit, in soul, in what we believe. Folks, doctrine is important. Paul preached doctrine. Paul preached the gospel. Christian fellowship is important. It's like the precious oil upon the head. That was a sign of the anointing. When they anointed someone with oil, they would pour the oil over its head and it would run down uh, into the beard. And for those who don't like beards, folks, it's in the Bible, okay? <laughs> running down on the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments, it is like the dew of Hermon. What is he saying? Let me tell you what he's saying. Lord, 
rain down on us. Rain down on us. Let the floodgates of heaven drop the Holy Spirit. Drop the anointing. Drop it on us. Folks, we cannot survive without water. Droughts kill everything. Droughts, and, and folks, I am telling you, we as a nation are in a drought right now. And it's up to us Christians to give people hope. To tell them it's going to be okay. To tell them that God reigns on the throne. To that, tell them that God wants to visit with us. It's that rain. is like the, uh, the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. There is nothing better than a fresh rain. For, the Lord, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. What is the blessing? Folks, that blessing was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, and we have life because of Him. We have everlasting life because of Him. So we see Paul's farewell message. Number two, Paul's farewell service. A unique service. If you were at this service, you would be talking about this service for weeks. Weeks, maybe months. Look back in our text in verse 7. Acts 27. Now, on the first day of the week, and he points that out, Luke is saying, because, folks, that happened at, at Calvary. When, when Jesus died on a Friday, he arose on a Sunday. The Sabbath for the Jewish uh, people were always on Saturday. But when the New Testament church came and the day of Pentecost came, it was moved to Sunday. Sunday is the day of the Lord. And when the disciples came together to break bread, and again, there was two things about this. Breaking bread was fellowship, okay? It was first fellowship. But it was also the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. And folks, I cannot wait till we get to break bread break bread again together. I'm telling you, the good old Baptist potluck dinner. I can't wait to have that one more time. And Paul, being ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. I wonder how many would stay here today till midnight. Folks, don't you ever complain about my long services. I... I Steve, I don't think I've ever went 45 minutes. Much less, eight hours? Midnight. And there were many lamps in the upper room. They did not have church buildings there. They met in people's homes. And many lamps means it is warm in there. And it says, and they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was seeking, seeking, sinking into a deep sleep. You know, I've experienced this in our church. <laughs> there are people out there, I'm, I'm looking up, and, and they're just praying for me during the service. <laughs> and every once in a while, I see a wife going, Poof, and they're going like that. All right? So it is possible to fall asleep in church. And he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Can you imagine being there? And all at once you hear this, bam, crash. And somebody thumps the ground. And they look out the window and the kid's not moving. Now folks, I'm telling you, there would be a holy hush up on that room and people would be running downstairs to find out if this guy was just knocked out or was he dead. But Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him, saying, do not trouble yourself, for his life is in him. You know how some people want to say this was, well, he just got knocked out. He was just not, got knocked out. But you know why and why I refute that? Because there was a doctor in the house. Dr. Luke was a physician. And I'm pretty sure, Dr. Frank, we can say, hey, we know who was. You know when someone's dead and when they're not. There's no doubt. Dr. Luke did his pulse and he was dead. But Paul, in faith, listened to the Holy Spirit. Paul did 
exactly what Elisha and Elijah did. He took this person up. He held them deep against him. And he began to pray for this young man. Listen to me, folks. Man has no healing power. But we have the discipline, or we should have the discipline in our lives to begin praying immediately when something bad happens. Would you get used to this? Would you do something when you hear an ambulance or a fire truck? Would you just start praying right then for whoever there is? You don't know where the wreck is. You don't know where the fire is. But those people need your prayers. And Paul in faith began praying. And he says, now when he had come up, he had broken bread and eaten. And he talked a long while, even to daybreak, he departed. He still was talking. Through all that, a guy falls out the window, dies, is resurrected, and we go back to preaching again. All right? And the Bible says, and they brought the young man alive in, and they were not a little bit comforted. Can you imagine? I got a story on Monday morning. Hey, what happened at your church yesterday? Well, why? Because I want to tell you something that happened at my church. The Apostle Paul was preaching, and a young boy fell out the window. And I'm telling you, Paul went down and prayed over him, and he became alive. Can you top that? <laughs> Folks, the word of what happened got all around there, okay? And the deal is, it wasn't, uh, you know, aimed towards Paul. Paul gave God the credit for everything good that happened in his life. But God was still uh, solidifying his ministry. God was still working miracles to prove who he was and what he could do. And the greatest miracle that we have seen, hold your finger there and go to John 11. John 11, and you know the story. Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha and Lazarus uh, had spent a lot of time with Jesus. Jesus would stay there. He would eat with them. He would rest there. And they were great friends. And they sent people uh, to uh, Jesus and said, hey, your friend, Lazarus is sick. But Jesus basically told them, hey, I'll get there. All right, don't worry about it. I've got this. I'll get there. And he waited. He waited three days before he even left. Matter of fact, as they were discussing that, some of the disciples said, hey, Jesus, don't you think we need to go? He's really sick. The word was he is close to death. And finally, in verse 14, he says, listen to me, guys, Lazarus is dead. I know he's dead. And can you imagine the puzzled look on his face, their faces? Why wouldn't he go? Matter of fact, he, he healed two people that wasn't even in the same town he was in. Folks, Jesus can do anything. God can do anything. But he chose not to. And folks, there is a reason and a purpose for everything God does. He does not waste tragedy. He does not waste hurt. He is teaching us. We are learning. We are being molded. We are being made into servants of his. And two of the favorite verses in this chapter is verse 25. And Jesus said unto her, he's talking about Martha. Matter of fact, Mary and Martha both had an attitude when Jesus came. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Amen. Folks, we are physically going to die, but we will live forever. There are things worse than death. You say, I don't think so. Can I take you to a nursing home? Can I take you to a VA hospital? where they struggle and can't even get out of bed. Where some of them are blinded. Some of them have lost both legs. Some of them have. Oh, folks, there are things worse than death. But Jesus is life. And Jesus said, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, I believe. But, but... That's what she was saying. 
And so Jesus finally said, show me where he is. Look in verse 38. And Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave. And a stone laid against us, and Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Why four days? Let me ask you a question. Which would be the greater miracle? Jesus reacting immediately and healing him, or Jesus waiting four days and raising him from the dead? There would be no doubt it was Jesus. No doubt. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Oh, folks, there is glory in death. There is glory in death. When we take our last breath here on earth, we take our first breath in heaven. Oh, folks, I've been, I've watched people pass from this life. And I know a lady uh, before that I was in the room and she started talking about seeing a light. She started talking about seeing a light. And she just raised her hands and got a big smile on her face. And she passed away so peacefully. Oh, folks, there's glory in death. There's glory in death. And it says, uh, Then they took away the stone in the place where the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you will always hear me. Because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you have sent me. What are you saying? I've already prayed about this. I already prayed. I've had, I've had three days to pray. And God's going to resurrect my friend Lazarus. He was sure of it because he was so in tune with God his Father. And now when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he say his name? Because if he said, just come forth, there's no telling how many people would have come out of those tombs. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. And it says, and he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave cloth, and his face was wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, loosen him and let him go. I am telling you, folks, I don't care what situation you are in. I don't care how bad things get. Jesus can do anything he wants to do. Our God is a miracle God. Our God is always on time. Our God can heal. Our God can save. Our God takes care of us 24-7, 365 days a week, a, a month, a year. There you go. <laughs> Folks, it's God. It's God. And let me tell you something. It's not over till he says it's over. So we see Paul's farewell message. We see Paul's farewell service. It was a service you would not forget. And now we see Paul's farewell journeys. And then he went ahead, verse 13, to the ship and sailed across to Azos. There intending to take Paul on board. So, uh, for he had so given orders, intending himself to go on foot. It was different from his life being threatened. Folks, there are times that as a Christian, you just need some time alone. You just need some time with God. You just think about this. Think about Jesus. He set the example before every big thing that he did. Every big thing. He spent time in prayer with his Heavenly Father. Folks, we need to be men and we, women of prayer. We need to be prayer warriors. We need that commune with God. We need that time in the Word of God. We need to meditate on the Word of God. We don't need to take polls, okay? You and God can figure it out. Just get in tune with God. And when He met us at Azos, we took Him on board and went to uh, Melitene, and we sailed from there the next day to the opposite Chios. And again, these are islands that they passed through. And, and as he stayed there, uh, he probably witnessed there. And the next day, he came to Miletus for 
for Paul had decided to sell past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Why did he sell past Ephesus? And folks, if you trace his steps, he was doing basically the same thing as he was doing in his second missionary journey. And he was going back to the churches there, and he had two things in mind. Number one, he preached to every one of them, encouraged them in the, in the faith. And you know what I think he was thinking? He was thinking, this is going to be my last time there. He knew he was going to Rome. He knew that he was getting older. He knew that he couldn't keep this travel up like he had done. He'd been on three missionary journeys. And his body, had, you know, it had taken a toll on that. And so here, what we really see is a transition with the life that he had left. He was leaving the ministry of the churches and he was going to start aiming at government officials and country officials. Why? Because, folks, they are the ones that can change a nation. Oh, folks, we have to pray. We have to pray for our government officials. We need to pray for our senators and our representatives. We need to email them and let them know how we feel. And we don't need to do it in an ugly way, folks. Just tell them how you feel and, and, and what is going on. We have to influence people that way. But the reason he didn't stop in Ephesus was because he spent three years there. All right? Three years he spent there. And he knew if he stopped, he wouldn't make it to Jerusalem. He'd already missed Jerusalem uh, uh, the first time uh, of the the Passover time. And then 50 days later, it was the day of Pentecost and he was wanting to make it there. Why? Because this was his farewell tour. Folks, Paul's passion for people in ministry was incredible. I do not think there's been another person, another person. You may throw the name Billy Graham around, which Billy Graham was a great saint of God. But think about what Paul did without communication, okay, without airlines, without these things. Folks, he changed nations. God used him to save thousands of people. He started many churches for the glory of God. And we can see his passion in that he loved God. One of the things that he had in his life was determination. Folks, we don't need to quit. We don't need to throw in the towel. We, won't, we don't need to say, what's the use? Folks, with God on our side, we can do anything. We can accomplish anything. I'm telling you, life is hard. I understand that. Life is unfair at times. I understand that. But there is peace amidst the storms of life. Jesus showed that in his own ministry. Man, the, the, the fishermen, the ones that had been on lakes all the time, a storm come up, what was Jesus doing? He's in the boat and he's sound asleep. Why? Because he had peace. Folks, we don't need to fall apart. We don't need to give up. We don't need to be negative. We want to see the silver lining. We want to give God the glory for everything that we see. So we need to be determined. We truly need to be like Paul and have a love for God, a love for his church, a love for people, and a love for the word of God. Turn to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And remember, he wrote this while he was in Corinth. Corinth was one of the most carnal cities ever. It was carnal. The church was carnal. If you'll read 1 Corinthians, you'll see uh, Satan just reared his ugly head there many times. But folks, what was Paul's focus? Folks, it wasn't on sin. He could not make somebody not sin. All right? All he could do was preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and help people uh, as much as he possibly could. Look at Romans 9, verse 1. I tell you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bear witness of me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief 
in my heart. You know what that's called? It's called a burden. It's called a burden. Folks, there's something different than being bothered. There's times, like a commercial on TV, and they'll show something, and, and we're bothered by it. But you know what we do? We just change the channel if it bothers us. But Paul had a burden. That means he thought about it. He lived it. He slept it. It was in the back of his mind. It was in his prayer life. It was in everything that he did. And listen to this. For I wish, for I, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. You hear what he's saying? He said a curse means I would go to hell for them if they would be saved. Can I remind you of somebody else who went through hell for us? Jesus was beaten for you. Jesus was crucified for you. Jesus shed His blood for you. And folks, He's not asking us to die for Him. He is asking us to live for Him. So we need to live for Him. Anywhere we go. In our actions. In our words. In our witness. In Romans 10, just one chapter over. Brethren, my heart's desire, Romans 10, 1, and prayer to God for Israel that they, that they may be saved. For I bear them the witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they be in ignorance of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Folks, there's a lost world out there. There's still a world out there. They are lost. They live in hopeless situations. And if they were to die today, folks, they would spend an eternity in hell. We don't even like to say that anymore. But folks, hell is a real place. And part of our jobs as Christians is to live our lives and be reflections of God's glory and a reflection of God's goodness so that when somebody asks us, why didn't you get upset? Why didn't you do this? We can say, it is Jesus. Oh, folks, we've lost our burden for souls. We've lost it. We've come more into what we call entertainment, folks. We don't come to church to be entertained. We come to church for God to speak through us through the Word of God, for the Holy Spirit to convict us, to convict us. And I'm telling you, everyone in here knows somebody who is lost. Somebody who is lost. Would you begin praying again? Would you begin believing again? Would you begin sharing the gospel again? I've done that before. Well, go back and do it again. You do not know that there could be a situation in somebody's life that has changed their outlook. They may be hurting, and they may be open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, folks, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. In my prayer today is that we will do the same. Father, thank you for the day. And I thank you for Paul's life. God, he was an amazing man. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of passion. And God, he was a man that loved you and loved the church. And God, I pray if there's one here today that doesn't know you, that today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray that you would just work your Holy Spirit in their life and they would get under conviction and come down and simply say Brother Mike, Brother Marty I need to be saved I need Jesus and God for others Christians I pray that they would just look at their own life God I know there has to be some that could rededicate their life to Christ I know they can do it in the pew and that's fine but God if you tell them to come down here God I pray they would obey the Spirit Lord, maybe somebody come for baptism or even church membership. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. So, God, I pray that you do a work in our lives. God, we'll be careful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?